Stay hungry, stay foolish. Leaders have experimented with open innovation programs, corporate accelerators, venture capital arms, skunk works, and innovation contests. They've traveled the world to learn from today's hottest, most successful tech companies. Yet, most would admit they've failed to create truly innovative cultures. There's a better way, and it all starts with the power of habit. The central argument in today's book is that the world's biggest untapped source of energy isn't the wind, water or sun, it is inside existing corporations, which are brimming with innovation energy. Today, that energy is largely constrained and contained. You need to release, harness and amplify it. Today's book will show you how. We welcome friend of the Innovation Show, three-time guest, our first ever three-time guest and author of a plethora of titles, as you can see from the Scott D. Anthony shrine behind me. Scott D. Anthony, author of Eat, Sleep, Innovate. Welcome back to the show. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I, I can't believe I'm the first three-time guest. Quite an honor. Absolutely, man. I, I, we, there's so much good thinking out there, but you have so much good thinking. And as I mentioned, the shrine is behind me here, and I've only got some of the books. That, there's eight titles that I know of that are out there. And you you kindly sent me some of your books about a couple of years ago. And as I was trying to get through that list, here you go, and you release another one. So, I, And good news for our audience. I have a copy of Eat, Sleep, Innovate, beautiful copy here, up for grabs. Just enter by... Sign up to the innovationshow.io newsletter and you will be in a chance with winning that. Scott, it's great to have you back. Let's start with the word innovation itself. We've discussed this before in some of your earlier books, but you do it again in Eat, Sleep, Innovate because it's so important. You say innovation can be described as something different that creates value. And it's the vagueness of the word. Something is a reminder that innovation is not the job of the few, but the responsibility of the many. The phrase creates value distinguishes innovation from its precursors, such as creativity and invention. This is a really important point and a foundational one for the book. Absolutely. And, and you know, both of those, uh, those points of distinction are important. You know, something different is broad enough that there is room for, yes, things like hypersonic planes and world saving vaccines, which we need as many of as we can get, <laughs> but also creates room for the day to day stuff that makes life just a little bit better. And that separation from invention to innovation in the creates value phrase reminds us until you do what you're trying to do, which might be revenues and profits, might be employee engagement, might be more satisfied customers, whatever, you haven't risen up to the bar of innovation. As Edison said, genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. So if you're not sweating, you're not innovating. I love that you mentioned Edison. I was telling my kids they're they're young, they're eleven and nearly eight, and I was telling them about this idea. We hear "fail fast and fail often," and that can be used in the wrong context because it's an excuse for failure. But I love the Edison real story of Edison, where he used to actually take down his failures, and the concept was, well, it's almost like I'm sculpting a piece of wood. I'm failing my way closer to the result or to the solution. That's an incredibly important point. And one of the things that has gotten to the point where it's become a bad cliche, where people have said, we should celebrate and embrace failure. And that's very much a yes, but. So yes, we should celebrate and embrace failure, but only if it's a certain type of failure. So that means that you are intelligent in the way that you failed. So you've been very scientific. You run the test. You've learned and you do something with that learning. If you just go and try something without thinking and you don't learn anything from what you've done, well, that's just a waste of time. And we shouldn't be celebrating that at all. Or if you do something stupid, you take a risk without thinking about it, we shouldn't be celebrating that at all. So the intelligent failure where people have been smart about what they've tried and extracted learning from it, that's the only thing that we should celebrate. And I'm sure that's what you're teaching your kids. Yeah, and you build on this because you say, Innovation can be developing a visual scorecard to track KPIs using standing meetings, for example, to increase efficiency. It doesn't need to be in invention. It, it can be innovating where, as you say, you're, something new that creates value can be brought into the very fabric of the organization. Absolutely. And I, I went back the clock about a year ago, and we have a, a good little internal example from my organization, Innosite. You know, a year ago, right when the pandemic is about to blow up worldwide, 
I'm talking to my colleague Asher and I'm saying, Asher, I'm not sure what to do because, you know, we were supposed to have this face to face workshop with one of our clients in May. It's pretty clear it's going to go virtual. And we just do all these things face to face to get people moving around, to get engagement, to get their perspectives on topics. And I say, Asher, is there any off the shelf tool that can replicate some of these things? He says, no, but like a good innovator, he's curious. And he says, well, what if we created our own? And we create this virtual tool that we call Walk the Line that's a highly interactive polling tool that has some unique features for it that's custom built for what we do. And honestly, to me, this was a lifesaver for us during the pandemic because it allowed us to have really good engagement with clients without being face to face with them. Now, again, is this a next generation iPhone that's going to revolutionize the way that people communicate? No, but it was something different that created, in my mind, a ton of value for us at Innosite. We celebrated Asher at the end of the year. We gave him one of our, our beloved values awards for all the things that he did to really live up to the behaviors that drive innovation success. And it's a reminder that every organization has innovation heroes like that, people like Asher, that just find creative ways to solve problems that make your world better. And sometimes that's ways to improve efficiency. Sometimes that's a way to be more effective when you're working with clients. Sometimes it's ways to create new products and services. All of it is good. Again, coming back to the children, even there, there's something I learned, and I think it was in the one minute manager, the Ken Blanchard classic. And he said, catch people doing something right. And that idea of because you talk about habit formation, and we've had the great BJ Fogg on the show before talking about habits. And one of the things we talked about was that th there's a dopamine release and, and even serotonin when people are kind of going great job, Asher. And then what's Asher going to do He's going to give you more of that. And this leads beautifully to the phrase itself culture of innovation, because you say it can be a barrier, as it is typically used in such a vague and ambiguous way. And it is ascribed to so many wildly different situations that it has become meaningless. And here you mentioned artifacts, one that you've just mentioned there, of innovation culture, manifestations of culture. You emphasize how artifacts are the tip of the proverbial iceberg and not the defining attributes of culture itself. We draw on the research from the great Edgar Schein, who has probably done the most thorough research about what an organization's culture is. And Schein points to basically three things. So there are the artifacts, there are the things that you see that are sometimes the reinforcers, sometimes the reminders, sometimes the totems that show what the culture is. But again, top of the iceberg. You get to the waterline, you say, well, what do people actually do? What are the behaviors that they follow on a day-to-day -day basis? And then you go one level below that and you say, well, what are the beliefs that led to them doing this versus that? Now, when we focus on culture of innovation, we really focus on that waterline level. The way we define it is a culture of innovation is one in which the behaviors that drive innovation success come naturally. So you don't have to exhort or extol or whip people to follow the behaviors that drive innovation success. They just do it because that's the way that people do things in their organization. And the book really focuses on defining what those behaviors are, what's standing in the way of following those behaviors, and what do you do to intervene to encourage them with the belief that if you change the artifacts, it has no impact. Trying to change beliefs is really hard. But if you get people to actually start doing different things, if you get those dopamine releases that you just talked about, then over time, the beliefs start to change, the artifacts start to reinforce, and the culture begins to change. And that highlights another aspect, which is this takes time. I, I often, the way I articulate it and my mental model for it is that it's innovation, culture, creation, or development is a, a ripple, not a splash. So oftentimes you've had this within a site, I'm sure I've had this with my workshops that an organization brings you in and it's a splash. It's this one off event. And innovation culture is developed through a ripple. It's constantly changing, just like any habit form. Absolutely agree. You know, so kind of the, the red thread that runs through Eat Sleep Innovate is DBS Bank here in Singapore. And their culture change journey has been 11 years and it ongoes. And we talk a little bit about the, the now very well studied case of Satya Nadella at Microsoft. And he was asked the question, when are you done? He said, never. If you're really trying to work on culture, it is a very perpetual thing. And I remember something that the, the late, great Harvard Business School professor and Innosite co-founder Clayton Christensen, one of the things he used to say, the half-life of a good educational experience, he would say, is about two weeks. So no matter how good it is, in two weeks, you've forgotten about half of it. Two weeks after that, another half. And by a business quarter, it's pretty much all gone. 
unless you actually do something with it and repeat and repeat and repeat. And that kind of gets to the, the wink in the title of the book, Eat, Sleep, Innovate. You eat every day, you sleep every day. Why aren't you innovating every day? And our argument is there are a set of things you have to do habitually, not every once in a while, but every single day, if you really want to have a culture that drives the behaviors that encourage innovation success. You mentioned behaviors here, the five typical behaviors. I'm going to come to that with this, but bringing it back to Edison again. Edison was extremely disciplined, and I don't, that's often overlooked. And there's this concept of Edison in the white coat as this lonely genius. That is, couldn't be further from the truth. And you say, while many people still believe that innovation is a mystical activity that requires God given skill, it is, in fact, a discipline. And like all disciplines, it can be managed, measured, mastered and improved with careful practice. And beyond the right environment, an innovator demonstrates these five typical behaviors you talk about. I'd love if you'd share these. So I mentioned the first one when I told the brief overview of Asher and the tool that he helped to create. First behavior is curiosity, the journey to do something different that creates value always starts with questioning the status quo with a question. What if, or why are we doing it this way, or how might we do it differently? Behavior two is being customer obsessed. You can't create value unless you solve a problem that matters to someone. In language that Innosite uses, unless you address a job that they're struggling to get done. Behavior three is being collaborative. One of the most persistent findings in the innovation literature is that magic happens at intersections. When different mindsets and backgrounds collide, Great innovators plant at the intersections, recognizing that none of us are as smart as all of us. Behavior four is being adept in ambiguity. Every idea starts its life imperfect. The way you make it better is not by studying it. It's by trial and error experimentation, just as we've talked about in this discussion. Then finally, behavior number five is being empowered. You can't do something different that creates value unless you actually do something. So of course, innovators talk, of course, innovators produce PowerPoint slides and word memos and all that, but innovators do. They go and sweat. They create physical versions. They create digital versions, whatever of their ideas. It's not just in their head. They do everything they can to make it real. So those are the five behaviors that we talk about in the book. There is one I wanted to zone in on a bit, which is um, adeptness and ambiguity, because that is certainly where most of the world is today. Even if an organization is on the good side of creative destruction, it's still ambiguous because we're learning, we're, we're exploring into unknown territory in many ways, particularly in the digital world. And you say something beautifully here, you say each early stage innovative idea is the same. It is partially right, and partially wrong. And the trick is to know which part is which great innovators act com confidently, despite incomplete information, expect iteration and change and excel at experimentation and celebrate judicious risk taking, they know that the path to creating value will have twists and turns, fumbles and false steps, and setbacks and moments that feel like failure. I thought that was really, really important in that going back again, bringing it back to children, we're just children with longer legs and eventually less hair as well, and maybe more hair in certain places. <laughs> but this idea that failing your way to success is absolutely core. But that is so much de demonstrated by leadership and, and actually middle management as well as leadership, where middle ma leadership may proclaim that. But it's the behaviors of middle management, how they react to, say, an Asher in their organization who tries something and it doesn't work out. And they're pushing their own personal boundaries as well. I think that's so often overlooked. And then they're shamed or they're made feel like they're failures. And it's the total opposite to dopamine cortisol is rushing through their, their veins. It is such an important point. And you know, one, one thing I, I will say that I'm very proud of our organization is we're really good at intelligent failure. We've tried a lot of things, you know, we, we built a nice, successful consulting business. We've had a lot of things that haven't worked. We, we tried to build a newsletter business. We tried to have a business where we sold CD-ROMs, not of us singing, but training videos. <laughs> we tried to do a train the trainer program with a third party company. We tried an incubator. We tried a venture capital arm. We've had a few different goes at, at digital platforms. We, we've tried it all. And the other things that we have done have not worked, but we have failed in the right sort of way. We have done judicious risk taking. And every time we say, okay, we've learned something from this. Let's at the very least fold that into our consulting services 
And let's next time we do it, let's do it that much better. And one of these days, we're going to figure out something that pushes the boundaries beyond the consulting business because we just are relentless and we keep pushing. So I'm really proud that we're able to do this. And this is something that I, I hope more companies can do as well, recognizing that, again, as long as you do it in the right way and you extract the right learnings from it, this is a good, not bad thing. And this idea of being adept in ambiguity, this really is a ubiquitous need now. I did something earlier this week where I was on a panel discussion with a bunch of accountants, accountants in Australia and New Zealand. And the question was, what is the number one capability that will matter for the future? And 73% of them said having an adaptive mindset. 73% of accountants said the most important thing that they needed was an adaptive mindset. So if accountants need it, I think it's pretty fair to say that everybody will need it. I should also note, I love accountants. I'm not making fun of them. My <laughs> grandfather, you know this, Aiden. My grandfather was a member of the Accounting Hall of Fame. So very near and dear to my heart, accountants. So not saying anything bad about them, just noting it's not the field where you'd expect the need for adaptive mindsets, but it's there and it's everywhere. And just a tip of the hat to your grandfather, because we've talked about him on previous shows. This is where the culture of innovation comes from in the Anthony line in the lineage of Anthony's because his book is still in print still being used because he pushed the boundaries of accountancy as well. Let's just briefly mention him. Just very briefly. So Robert, Robert N. Anthony Sr. He was a business school professor for four decades, mostly wrote academic books. The big innovative thing he did in the early 1960s is he wrote a book called Essentials of Accounting, which was a do it yourself workbook that allows people to teach themselves accountants without having to go to a fancy school or pay a teacher or whatever. And that book got up to the 13th edition, sold a couple million copies, you know, which is not Harry Potter numbers, but it, it's a lot <laughs> most accounting books sell. And, and I didn't know it when I was growing up. He's just grandpa. But, you know, once I, I started to understand Clayton Christensen's theory of disruptive innovation, and I studied my own family history. I said, my goodness, there actually is a disruptive innovator in my family who did exactly what Christensen talked about. Take the complicated, make it simple, take the expensive, make it affordable, and go and create an entirely new growth business. So I, I grandpa, it's in the gene somewhere, I guess. <laughs> I was just thinking of JK Rowling's initial pitch. So there's this kid and he's an accountant, right? <laughs> and they're like, oh no, no, that won't work. But it, it, speaking of people who fail their way to success, rejected she was rejected so many times in the pursuit of a publisher. And it was a small publisher who eventually took a punt on her. So a tip of the hat to her as well. But speaking of accountancy, you mentioned the financials of this, because oftentimes, a culture of innovation can be seen as this fluffy, nice to have experience, but it really does impact the bottom line. And it can be difficult to source studies on the positive impact of a culture impact of a culture of innovation. But in 2019, a team of your colleagues in an site compared the total shareholder returns of the 100 most innovative companies in a study by MIT, Glassdoor, and the S&P 500. Let's share those findings to win back those accountants who may be tuning out. So the research team found that those 100 companies that were identified by MIT, Glassdoor, outperform market indices by about 3.3 points. And what's interesting is in 2006, the last comparable study we could find, BCG did a, a very similar study and found the companies that were the most innovative companies outperform market indices by about four points. So two completely disconnected studies, 13 years between them, that found basically the same answer. Now, you can't be sure whether this actually is causality. It might turn out that Companies that perform really well are perceived to be innovative, so one has to admit that. But still, I think it's a pretty interesting finding that suggests if you're able to hit the seam, if you're really able to create a culture of innovation, it can have real demonstrable benefits in your organization and real demonstrable uplift in your stock price. I mean, 3.3 points a year for your performance, over time, that's a pretty big deal. You know, I, I really have empathy for organizations like banks, or even education, where they're highly regulated. And it often chases the innovators out of those industries. And you've worked deeply with DBS. It's, as you said, it's the red thread throughout the book, this case study. And I thought about this, that they often are are stuck by the regulation that was in in, in the organization. And this can this can really hamper people and block their their idea of progress. And instead of seeing that those growth figures, that extra percentile, whatever it might be, 
they kind of go, well, it's e- it's better just to stay the course and just have regular, maybe maybe a stasis. But what's happening at, on the outside of the organization is the industry is shrinking. It's this idea of the melting iceberg that, yes, they may be still hitting the same results within a shrinking industry. And this is where innovation becomes so important. There, there's a lot that we could explore in what you just said. So let me just make a, a couple of comments now. I, I think the, the first one is there is something that you have to accept that is a little bit of a paradox here where people say, well, I've got these constraints, therefore I can't innovate. Actually, constraints are one of the greatest enablers of innovation that you'll ever find because what constraints do is they really focus you and they say, okay, well, I'm not going to try and do everything, but I'm really going to try and solve this particular problem. So, you know, innovators are generally told to think outside the box and all that, but defining the parameters of the problem and saying these are the constraints along which you need to innovate actually can help a ton. That's point number one. Point number two, I certainly hear all the time from name the industry. Uh, I, we've got it harder than anyone else. The banks will say because we've got the regulators. The healthcare companies will say, well, we're dealing with human beings. The, pri- the companies that are, are privately held will say, well, we don't have the funds that public companies have. The public companies will say, we don't have the ability to think long term that the private companies have. Everybody thinks that they have it uniquely different. I I don't view that as an acceptable answer. I I think you can embrace innovation and you can drive it in any location, no matter what the constraints are. Of course, it is true that you have to accept regulation. You have to accept the realities of public markets, private ownership, whatever. But I, I have examples of organizations in every context that have done this. And look, we mentioned DBS a couple of times. One of the book's co-authors, Paul Cobbin, the chief data and transformation officer of DBS, This is a regulated bank in Singapore. Singapore is a process-obsessed country that is known for being rule-abiding. This is an innovation powerhouse. If it can be done by this type of entity in Singapore, it can be done anywhere. Something you said there sparked me back to the idea of constraints. And again, as as a parent, as you are as well, you've Harry is your son that you mentioned in the book. We'll talk about the happy Harry story in a second, but. One of the things I thought was the psychological impact of constraints on a child. So for example, if if you let a child roam freely and don't put barriers around, you know, like, you know, the terrible twos, this idea of the terrible twos, what, what a child is actually doing is kind of sensing how far they can push things. And if you don't put constraints on the child, I've read that there's a, a psychological impact on the child where they, they don't feel as safe. But if you put it like an imaginary bar- barrier around the child, they feel actually more safe and secure. And I often think about that in careers, that if there's just a general, hazy, ambiguous dictate throughout an organization that's like, be innovative, you're kind of going, yeah, but what's the boundary? And I think that's really important that you go, you know, level one is, you know, uh, you can experiment with anything up to 50,000 euro level two might be uh, experiment up to a 100,000. But let me know what you're expecting to see as a result, this kind of idea, I'd love your thoughts on that. Absolutely agree. So you know, I, I'll, I'll say a couple things. Number one, a, a metaphor that one of my clients in Singapore once gave to me, it was the CFO of a great big company here. And she was saying, you know, this is the way I think about managing innovation. It's like a bird has flown into my hand. And I don't want to lose the bird. So what are my choices? If I don't do anything, my palm is open, the bird flies away. If I hold the bird too tightly, well, I've got a different problem. So just enough. I need just enough. And this is what you need. You need just enough boundaries, guardrails, constraints, rules to say, basically, this is the way the sandbox is set up. This is the parameter, et cetera, et cetera. If you have too much, you're going to end up constraining, containing, et cetera. If you have too little, it's just going to be hard. People are going to get stuck. They're going to go in random directions. So the, the first idea is just enough. The second thing that I think is just really important to remember as you think about all of this, again, is a problem well-defined is more than half solved. Now, people inside organizations will say, I want more innovation. I want better answers for my people. Well, great. Make sure that you take the time to ask them good questions. So if you say the thing that really matters to us is whatever. We need our employees to be more engaged. Our net promoter scores with this particular customer segment are too low. It's too hard for us to adopt this new Salesforce tool or whatever. And you say, this is where we want the energy focused. You're going to see much better results. Just by metaphor, we're talking about Edison before. If you take light and you have it spread over big distances, it's really dim. You take light and you focus it, you get a laser beam. So what do you want? 
I think it's a pretty clear answer. I mentioned Happy Harry and there's a real, really important aspect behind this because we talked about, you know, inertia in organizations, but often they're driven by very human emotions such as fear. And in 2017, you asked a group of a thousand top executives in the consumer and retail industries to use their phones to answer a simple question. What single word describes what makes innovation a challenge within your organization? And fear was inescapable. It jumped out as top of the list, as did inertia. But to describe how this originates, and this is why I mentioned children a couple of times throughout the show so far, is it originates as children and the rules and sometimes ridiculous rules pushed on them. And this is the story of Happy Harry. This story is kind of my answer to something that's puzzled me for a while. I've got four kids here in Singapore. We'll see if any of them burst through the door. I hear a couple of voices in the distance over there. But, <laughs> yeah. but you know, the, the kids range in age right now from 15 to four. And the thing that's a puzzle to me is you know, we're hired by organizations to help them innovate and grow. And this is a perpetual and deep struggle for organizations. But I watch my kids and I don't have to teach them the behaviors that drive innovation success because they're kids and they're naturally curious and creative and like to try things and are willing to give things a go and will collaborate and all that because they're kids. So these are innate in children, but challenges in organizations. So the question is what happens along the way? And this incident with my now nine-year-old, then five-year-old boy, Harry, back in 2016 was kind of the click moment. So the short version of the incident, we, we got a letter in our condo association in Singapore describing an incident involving Happy Harry and a couple of his older siblings. Happy Harry, at the time, five years old, had this shock of blonde hair, lovable goofball. Happy Harry was his nickname at school. Everybody loved him. So we're surprised to read this letter that says that our children were caught vandalizing the flooring of the basketball court in our condo using, quote unquote, some materials. And, you know, good old Singapore had captured that image on CCTV footage. So what actually happened on the Sunday afternoon in question? Well, the kids were bored. They said, Dad, can we go down to the basketball court and draw a baseball diamond in chalk on the basketball court? If that CCTV footage was in higher definition, you would see it wasn't just the kids. I was there with them doing this heinous act of vandalism. The letter went on to say that fortunately our cleaners removed the stains, which is partially true and partially false. The stains were removed, but it wasn't by the cleaners. It started to rain before we even left the court. By the time we got back up to our condo, there's no evidence that the chalk was ever drawn on the court. So what lesson does Happy Harry take from this? The lesson he learns is that creative expression, even benign creative expression, carries a risk that you're going to get slapped on the wrist. You go to school and you learn right answer, wrong answer. You go to an organization, the way we do things, the way that we don't do things. It's no surprise that organizations struggle to innovate. The happy Harry is inside people, but learned helplessness to set in. It's constrained. It's contained. That's the lesson I learned from the chalk incident in Happy Harry. I've thought deeply about this where in a, an or, in, in a country and it's happening more and more where there's cameras everywhere, there's people being watched everywhere and this idea of a surveillance state. When that happens, people's behavior changes because they feel that they're being watched. But it's the same thing within organizations. Sometimes somebody who's your colleague is almost like a, a snitch that, you know, you made a mistake, et cetera, et cetera. So it follows us into organizations because there's a scarcity mindset. And, and that's often led by leadership where it's like, well, if Aiden isn't doing so well, there's more doing well for Scott to celebrate. And it's it's a real killer of so much innovation. But here, one of these invisible rules sets essentially is shadow strategy. And you say shadow strategy quietly tugs and nudges a company down a path of perpetuation even if circumstances demand something drastically different. I'm smiling because I'm going back to that notion that Insight fails all the time. The, the other, I'm now thinking about personal failure. You know, so I, I've had the good fortune of having a few articles published in the Harvard Business Review. And for every one that I get in, I have three that I submit that doesn't get in. And I tried three different times to get an article about shadow strategy, and it just kept getting rejected. So finally, I got it into the book, which made me happy. You know, the, <laughs> 
I <laughs> love it, by the way. I love, I love, uh, even the title, that would jump out. I, that would be clickbait for that. me, my friend. I thought so. But, you know, uh, the, the editors are tough and they're great editors. So I, I always respect their viewpoint, even if I disagree with it. But, uh, you know, the, the basic idea is pretty simple. So the idea is strategy isn't what you say. Strategy is what you actually do. It's where you spend your time. It's where you allocate your resources and so on. So there is the stated strategy. There's all the things that you say you want to do as an organization. And then there's the shadow strategy that is driven by all your resource allocation systems, by your metrics, by your measures, by the way that you incent people. And that invisible shadow strategy is what engineers engineer. It's what the marketers market. It's what the product developers develop and so on. And there's a whole range of mutually reinforcing things in your shadow strategy that perpetuate today that stop you from creating tomorrow. And as I thought about this more, there's an even simpler way to put it. Organizations exist to do what they're currently doing by definition, and they exist to do what they're currently doing more effectively and more efficiently. Innovation is something different. So by definition, innovation runs counter to what organizations are designed to do. The shadow strategy takes an innovation and shrouds it and pulls it back so it looks like everything the organization has done before. So if you're not conscious of it and you don't work to break it, no matter how much you talk about it, no matter how much you say you want to do it, you're never going to actually do something different that creates value. And I want to acknowledge that you, you say this as well, because these this actually describes so many of our listeners of this show. You say those individuals, such as many of our listeners, are those who break free of self-imposed constraints, but must therefore wrestle against st shadow strategy, which institutionalizes inertia through reinforcing systems, structure, strategy, norms, and much more. And I'm sure people listening will go, oh, that's exactly what's going on here. And just a flavor of what is in the book. But let, let's move a little bit more because we're, we're going to run out of time. And I really want to talk about beans and not baked beans, not any kind of uh, kidney beans, nothing like that. These are really usable, actionable insights from the book. I'd love if you'd take it away on this, Scott. Absolutely. So biggest problem, you've got human beings that are innate innovators, they've got the capabilities inside them. Organizations suffer from the shadow strategy that institutionalizes inertia. So you have to break that inertia. You got to bring Happy Harry back. You have to encourage the behaviors that drive innovation success. So you're talking here about habit change at scale. So the idea of a bean rips from the habit change literature. Pablo Picasso, good artist copy, great artist steal. We stole an idea from one place and applied it to another with a nice acronym around it and says, if you study that literature, you learn that if you're trying to fight the battle of habit change, you have to fight on two fronts simultaneously. Front one is behavior enabler. That's the BE in the acronym. This goes after the rational, logical part of our brain where we make very conscious decisions. So you give people checklists and coaches and tools to help them do new things. The AN in the acronym is front number two. This is going after the unconscious, the part of your brain that makes decisions without you even realizing it. These are artifacts and nudges. These are indirect ways to encourage and reinforce behavior change. This is the picture on the wall that soaks into your unconscious that leads you doing things without you realizing it. Or this is somebody using gamification principles. You get a leaderboard. You say, Ugh, I'm number seven out of 10 in my department, and I'm motivated to do so much more without anyone telling you to do it. So that two front war, the behavior enabler, artifact and nudge, that's the tool that we suggest in the book that can break the inertia, that can encourage the behaviors that drive innovation success. And in the book, we've got 101 of them that people can shamelessly steal all on the companion website, eatsleepinnovate.com, to encourage those five behaviors that we talked about before. Some of your favorite beans include DBS's Gandalf scholarship. I loved if you, I'd love if you share this because it encourages curiosity, just like Asher was encouraged with an insight and Amazon.com's future press relief, really important one, which reinforces customer centricity. BI's lunch roulette, which is an absolutely great one and so actionable. I'd love if you'd share these ones. Let me quickly go through all three of those. So first, the Gandalf scholarship, I have to explain why it's called Gandalf. So DBS, part of its transformation is saying, historically, we were a slow moving, stodgy regulated bank. We have to become a startup at scale, a 28,000 person startup. 
our competitive set can't be other banks. It has to be Google and Alibaba and Netflix and Apple and LinkedIn and Facebook. If you put a D in between those letters, you form the word Gandalf, the wizard from Lord <laughs> of the Rings. So that's the idea. Gandalf is one of the icons of their transformation effort, changing their competitive set, pushing their innovation frontier significantly. One of the things they said that we have to do to be a Gandalf company is we got to learn a ton because there's so much going on, everything from artificial intelligence to how we can be better storytellers inside our organization. The challenge is so much to learn. What courses do we offer? The idea of the Gandalf scholarship is make it simple for people to learn what they want. If you get a Gandalf scholarship, you get a thousand Singapore dollars. It's about 750 US dollars that you can spend on any kind of education you want, anything you want to learn about. Only one requirement. You have to teach it back to the organization and the teach back is recorded. These teach backs are then put on a central website so everybody can echo on your learning. Everyone can learn what you learn. That does a couple things. Number one, it really reinforces learning because the best way to learn is to teach it to other people. Number two, DBS gets huge bang for its buck. It has learned that it gets 30 fold improvements in every dollar in the productivity of every dollar it spends on Gandalf scholarships versus traditional in-class learning because the learning amplifies through the organization. So that's the, the Gandalf scholarship. The Amazon press release from the future. Amazon, one of its missions is to be the world's most customer-centric companies. When it's working on a new idea, it does not ask people to come up with PowerPoint slides, et cetera, describing the idea. It asks them to write a future press release. Imagine when the product that you're working on is launched. What is the press release that will announce the launch? And it's got to start with the benefit that it's going to give to the customers. A very simple way to reinforce that customer centricity is the most important thing in our organization. Then when they have meetings, they have a ritual. It isn't people present to them. Everybody reads the memos first, and then they have an honest to goodness conversation about it. Then finally, BI's Lunch Roulette. This was launched by an employee in the U.S. about 10 years ago now. He went to lunch one day back in the good old days when we used to go to offices and all that. He got to the corporate canteen and he had one of those moments we've all had. He looked around, couldn't find any friends. There were no open seats. So he kind of sadly took his lunch back to his office when he really wanted to go and meet and mingle with other people. So he found an engineering friend to hack together this idea of lunch roulette. It is very simple. You go to a website and you say, these are days that I am open to having lunch with new people. These are the locations I'm willing to go to. The virtual roulette wheel spins and you're paired with four or five, six other people. It's a great way to encourage collaboration, a great way to expand networks inside organizations and a little bit fun as well. So those are our quick overviews of a few, three of the 101 beans that are in the book. <laughs> and one of the things I thought about the roulette is something you said, and, and I can't find the source of this, by the way, I, I only mentioned it the other day, in, innovation happens at the intersection. You said magic happens at the intersections. But if you think about that from a lunch roulette perspective, having conversations, even what frustrations are you having in your or your department, you know, I was going to say silo, but in your department of the organization, what what's going on, and then somebody might say something, you go, actually, that might be really useful for a project I'm working on. And this is innovation at the intersections in practice. And I was just thinking about this last night. I, I had a, there was a global leadership team call for or Zoom for Innosite. I was in a breakout group with a couple of my colleagues, and we just had one of these moments where someone said, what are you working in this? And like, oh, this thing I'm doing with my client is exactly that. And we're like, well, this is good. This is a, a good intersectional moment where good things will happen. And, and just having that conversation and having those connections and recognizing that innovation really can come from anywhere. There's a, a study I read recently that said the function inside organizations that comes up with the most innovative ideas is, wait for it, the procurement function. You say, well, that's bizarre. You know, procurement exists to, you know, beat up outside vendors and drive down prices. <laughs> yes, a little bit of that, but procurement's also spending all of its time focused externally. That's all they do. So they're out there seeing things all the time. Many organizations wouldn't even think to ask their procurement people, what are you seeing? What are you feeling in the marketplace? But something like Lunch Roulette creates those intersectional moments where if you ask questions like that and you've got basic curiosity, you never know what you're going to encounter. I so much agree. Uh, you know, I did a project with a regulation team and it was on the permanent reinvention mindset, the, the 
main core aspect of my book, as you know, and I want to thank you hugely. Scott wrote a beautiful endorsement for the book and actually read it, which is way more important because some people don't. But Scott's like, well, I need time to actually read this book. And I really respected that because you are an influencer within that book. I credit your re- your writing so much within that book as well, because you've really influenced my thoughts. So I thank you for that. But I wanted to mention about regulation, that off like, pr- like procurement, regulation knows the constraints. And if they know the constraints, I often think of the idea of a spider graph, they know the edges. And if they know the edges, they also know where the gaps are. And if you can change their mindset, they can start spotting the white space for innovation. But there has to be communication throughout the organization, there has to be these lunch roulette opportunities, where they can share those insights with the rest of the organization. And there's usually not. So let me say a couple of things. First, it was a pleasure to read and endorse the book. I, I did greatly enjoy it. And I, I suggest, of course, all, all your listeners, viewers, etc. I, I go pick up a, a copy of it when, when it's available. It's a, a very good read. And I thought it had a lot of useful tools in it. So that was the first thing. And then to the regulators, you know, we, we've seen over the course of, of the past year, we have seen some amazing things that regulators have done. And, you know, if you, you go back in time 12, 13 months ago and say that we would have a widely deployed vaccine in 12 or 13 months, people would say, no way, you know, it takes 10 years to do a vaccine. And of course, it's not perfect. There are, are certainly blips and bumps and there's going to be steps backward and all that. But absolutely amazing things from regulators and markets thinking smartly about what they're going to do and how they're going to do it. And I've seen examples here too in Singapore, the Monetary Authority of Singapore, Singapore Central Bank. A couple of years ago, it set up what it called a sandbox. It said, we want to encourage more fintech, financial technology innovation, but we don't want to take down the banking system. That's a pretty reasonable thing. So let's create essentially a safe space where either existing banks or startups can go and play and try different things. This idea of saying, where are the gaps? Where are the edges? What can we do where there's safety to go and experiment is something that I think regulators need to do. And the more they can talk amongst themselves and between other regulators in the world, the more they can see, huh, there actually are things that we can do. We do have happy Harry's in our organization. We can actually encourage in the right way, the right forms of innovation without taking systemic risk, without creating it. And of course, you need to do that. It's a balancing act for anybody who's in a field like that. I, I'm, you know, it's one of the things that drives me, Scott, with the show is that there's so many happy Harry's out there, and they're unhappy. And that that trickles into their own lives. And it affects and, and actually many change makers and innovators and entrepreneurs within organizations are extremely frustrated. And it's not mentally, it's not very healthy mentally, you know, I, it's one of the things that really drives me is to try and turn that because people, there's a lot of talk about corporate wellness and mental health, etc. at the moment. But th- this is a, I know it's a microcosm within that, but it's so often overlooked. Clayton Christensen, who I mentioned before, you know, the, the, the book, two books that had the most influence from just a pure academic theory, there was the innovator's dilemma, the idea of disruptive innovation, and so on. A more mass market perspective was his book, How Will You Measure Your Life? And I distinctly remember the speech that he would give that turned into the article that turned into the book and this thought experiment he would run. And he would talk about back when he was a CEO and he was a CEO before he was an academic. He imagined himself at, at a company party over the summer. And he imagined a, a woman working at his company who had had a bad day. And she then goes home and she's a bad wife and a bad mother and a bad friend because she's carrying it with her. And then he imagines her having a great day, living up to her full potential, being able to innovate, being able to grow. And she feels full, fulfilled. And she goes home and she's a great wife, mother, friend, and all those sorts of things. And Clay's line is management, when practiced well, is the most noble of professions because there's nothing else that you can do that can influence so many people. And we really take this to heart. If you allow organizations to unleash this latent innovation potential, more people are doing the equivalent of practicing at the top of the license. The unhappy Harry's are becoming happy. People are feeling fulfilled. They're feeling like the work that they're doing has meaning. And just think about how that cascades. Think about the kind of impact that it has. It's hugely motivating for me. It's hugely motivating to my colleagues. Speaking of innovation happening at the intersections or magic happening at the intersections, th- these books behind me are are exactly that. I get to talk to great people like you every week and I read the book like you did for me. But the joy of that is that you start to see trends in totally unrelated places. Like, for example, this is where I'm going with this. 
we did a show a couple of weeks ago with Caitlin O'Connell on her book Wild Rituals. So it was rituals from animal kingdom that were relevant to humankind. And when I read about beans in here and artifacts and rituals, etc, it got my synaptic uh, synapses firing all over the places. And, and I thought about how some rituals that, that Caitlin talked about in her book are actually defunct. And I've just written an article on this that there's this bird called the blue footed booby, right? And it's this bird in the Galapagos Islands has blue feet. It does this dance to attract its mate because the dance uh, shows its prowess as a mate, etc. But there, it also goes through with a ritual that's defunct, where it offers a twig, a nuptial offering to the female booby as an offering to build a nest. But here's the thing. The female booby doesn't build a nest anymore because it's evolved beyond the need to do that. And it actually lays eggs on the rocks. And I thought, actually, sometimes as innovators, we have to go through these hoops and, you know, uh, rituals that are, to us are defunct and stupid and we question them. But actually doing so is really important. And I just would love your thoughts on this because I, I thought about sometimes we need to go through that ritual because it unlocks a gateway to even a small win. I've got two thoughts. Uh, number one, uh, three thoughts. First thought, great story. So I, I appreciated listening to it. The second thought is, you know, absolutely. Sometimes you, you got to do what you got to do because that ritual creates conditions where the person to whom you're trying to sell an idea, the person to whom you're trying to motivate, they've now gotten into a certain state where they're ready to receive. And you might not love it. You might think it's kind of silly, but ultimately your goal as an innovator is to get to yes. You, you want people to sign the check, give you the team member, et cetera. And, and if you got to give them a stick, give them a darn stick. <laughs> That's the second thought. The third thought is I wonder, I wonder, you know, one of the, the good things that's happened over the course of, of the past year as we've been through this global pandemic is we have realized a lot of the fundamental assumptions that we were making were just wrong. So in our business, we assume you can only deliver advisory services if you travel to a client site and you sit next to a client. And we've learned that, of course, it's better along some dimensions to spend time face to face with human beings. But there's a lot that you can do through a screen without having the wear and tear on the planet and on yourself flying all around the world. And it was just a, an assumption that 100 percent of people agreed with that was proven false. And there were lots of assumptions like this. So I wonder if some of those twig given rituals will go away because the last period of time has shown people that you don't actually need to do them and the world will be okay. Brilliant. And last question for you is speaking, you, you mentioned the, the exactly the right thing about creating conditions. And I thought about the prep work required to, for a culture of innovation, because this is often overlooked, and we rush to execution as is our nature oftentimes as humans. But again, and this is you, I, I write an article each week, Scott, that's based loosely on the book that I've read and the intersections of other books that I've read. And the one that you inspired me to complete was when I was a kid, my grandmother asked me to paint a gate. And I was an eight year old kid. So I was like, great, I'm just going to get to splash paint all over the place. Great. It's outside. I don't have to worry about cleanup or anything like that. But when I got to the gate, it was rusty and it was old. And I was like, going, oh, and then I looked down and there was a wire brush. There was there was a tarpaulin to gather all the bits of old paint that was there. But there was also primer. And it made me think, actually, this is what preparing the culture is like. There's work that needs to be done before you are added in an additive mindset. You can't add things until sometimes you take some other stuff away or prime the organization for change. This is, uh, you know, we can spend another <laughs> day probably talking about this. But, you know, as I've been thinking about this a lot since the book has been published and we continue to think about conditions for success, leadership implications, and so on. To me, the number one thing you need to do to prime your organization is to draft on the great research that Amy Evanson from Harvard has done and create an environment that is psychologically safe, where people feel like that they can speak truth to power, they feel like they can take well thought out risks, they feel like they can disagree and, and have constructive discussions. Psychological safety does not mean everybody is hugging each other. It doesn't have to be that environment. It can be a really, really tough environment, but people are disagreeing about issues, not disagreeing about people. 
So as I thought about what it really takes to create that kind of environment, to me, it comes down to two things. Number one, you have a foundation of trust. Francis Fry, Brene Brown have done great research in this area. Trust comes when leaders do what they say they will do. They are who they actually are. They're authentic and they lead with empathy. Those are the preconditions for trust. And then you also have an environment that encourages what Linda Hill also from Harvard would call creative abrasion. The idea is you need to have that kind of disagreement to have the sparks that will ultimately kindle innovation and will feed psychological safety. You need to be able to disagree without being disagreeable. So you get that foundation of trust. You encourage creative abrasion. It helps to encourage psychological safety. It allows everything else to happen. There's no silver bullet for this. This is not easy stuff to do. But one of our missions is give people the language, give people the tools, give them the places to start and help them begin to move in a direction and show them with people like Satya Nadella at Microsoft and Piyush Gupta at DBS and individual departments like Eileen Tan at Singtel. This is possible. You can create a culture of innovation if you make the commitment, if you do the work. Fantastic. It's a great way to finish. And I just want to remind our audience, I'm going to grab it from the shelf here. I have a copy of Eat, Sleep, Innovate up for grabs. Just sign up to the innovationshow.io newsletter. And I highly encourage people to engage Scott to for keynotes, for workshops, etc. He's changed cultures throughout organizations throughout the world. Inside is a global organization as well. But Scott, it's always a huge pleasure to have you on the show. Where can people find out more about your books and indeed InnoSight? So this particular one, eatsleepinnovate.com, is the easiest place to find more information about the book. InnoSight.com has all the information about all the other books. You mentioned my colleague, Mark Johnson. We, we, we do, we're a consulting company, but we also publish a lot. And the easiest place to find me is through LinkedIn. That, that's a, the social network where I, I spend the most time. But it's been a, a pleasure, as always, Aiden, being part of your show. I'm looking forward to being your first fourth time guest in our <laughs> years. Yeah, and I have to get through those books, as you know, and I will. I, I always do. It's been an absolute pleasure, Scott. Again, my thanks for your endorsement of my book and your work in Indeed in reading it. I know time is precious. Eight books, four children and a wife and a pandemic and you still deliver every single time. So it's an absolute pleasure. Author of Eat, Sleep, Innovate, Scott D. Anthony, thank you very much. Thank you. Awesome, man.